All right, so it's 12.30, and we're going to go ahead and uh, start with Dave Kenny's presentation on VSPRO updates. So I'm going to mute my microphone here, and Dave, uh, we're ready for you. Okay. Uh, hopefully everybody can see and hear me. Um, this year, a little bit different than what I've done in the previous year. So in the past, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time going into the details and the nitty-gritty theory of the solver and the vortex lattice versus panel methods. I am not going to talk about really any of that today. Um, and as Brandon mentioned, all you know, all this is going to be recorded. But you know, one thing he didn't mention, I don't think, is you know, all last years and the you know the, of the virtual uh, presentations were recorded as well. So if you are interested in kind of the theory behind VSPRO, I recommend you go and take a look at last year's workshop uh, presentations, not just mine, but specifically for VSPRO, where I basically gave the same spiel I've given previous years that go into the details of the solver. Um, so today I'm going to basically spend time just going over what's new. It's going to be a little bit of higher level uh, presentation and uh, definitely open to questions. I'll leave it to Brandon if he wants to bring them up while I'm going or if we just hold them to the end. Um, but there we go. So outline. Uh, going to go over some some new stuff. Uh, just kind of like uh, not, not really big stuff, but new stuff that there. Uh, Rob mentioned a little bit of it. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the the updates that have gone into the current version of code, um, and that will going to be uh, rolled out. Uh, you know, whenever the next update uh, gets pushed out. Uh, specifically, just talk about style prediction, some structural analysis support, some optimization support, and then uh, a little bit about things that go round and round. So, just new stuff. Uh, the first one, Rob mentioned this, Reynolds number sweeps are supported. So, you know, in previous versions of the code, you could run angle of attack sweeps, mock sweeps, you know, a combination of the two, when you basically get a square database across all the mock and angle of attack uh, cases. And you can now put in a list of Reynolds numbers, um, and it will basically write out a dot .polar file that has, you know, the solutions for CL, CD, CM, et cetera, as a function of mock, angle of attack, and Reynolds number for all the mock alphas and Reynolds that you put into the code. And the Reynolds number sweeps are really, you know, essentially post-processing. The, the solver is an inviscid solver. It's either running vortex audits or panel methods. And so the Reynolds number sweeps are basically a post-processing to make an estimate for the viscous drag. And as well, so we'll talk later, uh, apply the stall model if you have that turned on. And so in, for the most part, doing those Reynolds number sweeps are almost free. Um, they, they cost very little time in terms of you know solution time added into a you know mock alpha sweep. Spanwise loading for panel mode. So in the past, if you ran the vortex lattice code, you got a load file that gave you basically spanwise loading information because that was easy to post process out of the vortex lattice code. Um, we support that now in the panel code. Um, it's going to work best for the VSP geom. Uh, file format that Rob is going to talk about later, um, but it does work for the CompGeom meshes as well. Um, but there are some caveats where it, it, it could get confused. Um, for some moment calculations, uh, there was actually a lot of work that's been done over the last year to improve the accuracy of for some moment calculations in general. Um, that ended up in the current release that's out there being a bit slower than previous releases. It's just doing more work. Um, to try to do a better answer. Um, the next release is basically back up to par, so I bought back um, some of that slowdown. So we pretty much be back at par where we were, and uh, in general, we'll get improved accuracy for the force of moments. Um, BSP JOM support, so Rob will talk about that, but that's basically a, um, kind of merging both the panel and the vortex lattice models into a file format that in general, could support both. Um, and they're a little bit more flexible uh, than what we had in the past. 
And then as Rob mentioned, a lot of old bugs are fixed, and I'm sure we've added some new ones. Um, so bear with us. So jumping into stall prediction, uh, we've in implemented a very simple-minded stall prediction methodology. It's, it's based on this paper method for prediction of winning maximum lift. Um, I basically use that. It's basically a model for calculating essentially you know, a bound on minimum pressure coefficient. Um, I modified it to account for Reynolds number based on Carlson CP limit correlations. So it's a function of both mod, local Mott number and local Reynolds number. And so it basically is a post-processing to the solution. So you run your solution at some Mott number and angle of attack. Um, you'll get a lift dragon moment from that as you always have. And if you have this model turned on, it will go um, basically along your wings and look at this model to basically identify places where it thinks that you've stalled the wing um, and point out it, it really is only being applied to wings at this point. Um, this is, like I said, it's a simple post-processing, so it really doesn't cost anything in to apply it um, so that solver doesn't run any slower. Um, and if you're doing a Reynolds number sweep, like I said, this model is a function of both Reynolds number and Mach local Mach number on the wing. So if you run a Mach number of 0.6 and an angle of attack of 15 degrees and do 20 different Reynolds numbers from low to high, you know, it basically is just a post-processing at those different Reynolds numbers of that single invested solution that you're given Mach number and angle of attack. So it's very fast um, to use this model. It's not really gonna cost you anything. Um, it works for both the VOM and the panel modes of the solver. And just as a simple test case, I looked at the NASA EET uh, configuration, uh, picked out just basically looking at a clean configuration, the experimental data, it's about Mach 0.1, Reynolds number about a million. So this is just the geometry for that EET configuration. So I'm just looking at the wing body, so I'm not modeling up the nacelles. And you know, for this, I'm just looking at the stall on the wing. So we did, didn't bother to, to model up the horizontal tail or the vertical tail either. Um, so in VOM mode, that's just the, the vortex lattice model there down in the lower right. Ran it through a sweep of angle of attacks at that point one-ish Mach number and about a million Reynolds number. The purple curve there in the upper left corner is the CL versus angle of attack. Um, and for the normal VSPRO solver, you know, you, it doesn't know anything about stall. It's just going to chug along, so you can give it angles of attack of 15, 20, 25. You can run it at 45 if you wanted to. And for the most part, the, the lift is going to go up essentially linearly. Um, there'll be some drop off um, just from the theory. Um, same thing if you look at the drag puller, right? It's, you know, basically drags. This looks like a parabolic drag puller up at these, you know, incredibly high CLs that are just not physical. If you turn on the CLX model, um, it, and for this case anyway, it's doing a really good job of predicting that stall point. So again, it's just looking at the pressure coefficients on the wing um, and identifying a limit based on both the local Mott number and the local Reynolds number, and determining if, uh, you know, in a spanwise uh, strip on the wing, if that section has stalled or not, and um, tries to estimate what percentage of that in the cordwise direction uh, that section is stalled. And so if you look back there, the blue curve is the experimental data. And the green curve is the VS Piro solution post processed with the CO Max uh, stall model turned on. Um, you know, and it's, it's doing uh, probably better than it deserves to do for this geometry. Um, and in the upper right hand corner is just the polar, again, compared to the experimental data, which they, they took it out you know, to these really high angles of attack. Um, and then in the lower left, uh, Surprisingly to me, it actually does a decent job of the pitching moment. So, uh, it, it, you know, you see that, that stall, the pitching moment, um, you know, it kicks up, vehicle basically goes unstable, CM alpha is positive at that point, 
Um, and it, it actually captures that. Panel mode results are very much the same. A little bit more noise in terms of the drag pullers. Um, but again, basically, it's doing a decent job of predicting the stall. Um, a little bit over prediction in the CL in general from the, the panel code. Um, that tends to be basically the vortex lattice method. You know, you're, you're getting two wrongs make a right. Vortex lattice method, you're ignoring thickness. Uh, you're also ignoring the boundary layer buildup along the wing, which is going to affect the CL. Um, panel mode actually has that thickness, but it doesn't have the boundary layer. Um, so you tend on geometries like this to, to actually capture more of the CL that you should from an inviscid code. And then you would have to add in a boundary layer solution to actually get back to what the vortex lattice was giving you. That said, obviously, from a panel code, you do get the upper and lower surface distributions of the pressure that you're missing from something as simple as a vortex lattice model. But again, in general, both the CL um, and CDs uh, generally match up with the experiment, and you also capture that pitch up in the CM uh, at the stall. So structural analysis support. Uh, this was something that's been asked for for quite a while, something I've been wanting to do for quite a while. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll get some questions on this. Um, but basically, uh, you know, we have been open VSP. There's been a lot of work done to do basically the internal structural analysis or buildup of the structural analysis for both calculus and NASTRA and finite element models. So, um, you know, you can go in and model your spars and your ribs and the skin and use the built-in mesh generation tools in OpenVSP to generate the models for either NASTRAN or the open source uh, finite element solver calculus. Uh, what was missing in this whole path was a way to get VSP arrow loads into either that NASTRAN or Calculix model. So you, you would end up with a finite element model that basically had no loads in it. I mean, you could go in by hand and add in some loads. You could go in and add weights, uh, things like that. But there was no easy way to map a VSP arrow solution um, into a either calculus or NASTRAN uh, finite element model. Uh, for now, uh, calculus is fully supported. Um, it would be fairly easy to do NASTRAN. I just don't actually have anybody running NASTRAN right now that I could actually test out that, that whole process. Um, but I don't expect it would be a big deal. Um, it's basically a file format uh, at this point. Both the panel uh, solution and the OM models are supported. Um, for the panel solver, we basically will map the surface pressure straight to the skin model that's coming out of OpenVSP for the finite element geometry. For the VLM models, you know, you have this potato chip model, so we don't really have an upper and lower surface. What you have is a you know, a single potato chip surface um, and a delta pressure basically through those. Um, and so what we've done is just basically split the difference. So we basically will apply half of that delta pressure to the upper wing surface and half to the lower surface, as we really don't know what that, that split is coming out of the vortex lattice code. Um, but the net load uh, would be mapped over just half of it basically is going to be applied on the lower surface and half would be applied on the upper surface. Um, the viewer uh, for VSP arrow has been updated so we can, you can view Calculix input files um, and then you can also view the Calculix solution files. And again, uh, it's basically down to the file formats. So there's no reason why we couldn't do this as well for the NASTRAN files in the future. So just as an example, grab the EET again. Uh, just kind of went through with a, a default setup, uh, not anything really to compare to here, but just trying to show the process. We've actually done a bunch of internal use of this on other geometries, and it, it generally is doing a really good job. 
um, compared to you know other codes using Astrin and, and higher fidelity CFD. Um, so I modeled up the EET just looking at the wing. Uh, basically, skins, ribs, and spars were modeled. Uh, I'll let, I don't know if Raw who's going to talk about this in, in the workshop, but if you're interested in the details that the FEM modeling, I'm sure there's it's a lot for going over that this week. Um, so you can view the calculus outputs now in viewer just to make sure that you know everything's the way you expect them when they were written out to the file. You can obviously view these in OpenBSP already, but just the view of the skin, kind of the default mesh that came out and the default mesh for the ribs and spars. Um, just with, with all the default materials, which are just uh, some standard aluminum. So uh, on that, just ran the wing alone. Um, there's a typo there, it's supposed to be VSB air on the lower. That's just the panel solution, that's the, the CP contours. Um, and then there's basically a tool now, um, it's called ADV to load, that will map that. CP distribution over to the finite element surface. So I mean, these look like the same geometry they are, but they're actually two different meshes. So the, the left one is the VSPRO geometry and mesh uh, using the comp geom to generate it. On the right is the unstructured mesh uh, generated in the uh, finite element. Routines with an open VSP, so we're mapping that across. The, the contour colors are different because just to point out that you know, on VSP Euro is calculating the coefficient of pressure, the loads that go into Calculix are in fact the pressures. So you'll have to de define basically a dynamic pressure um, to do that conversion over from CP to actual pressures when you generate this load case and do the mapping. Uh, once you've done that uh, and you've set up a number of other things within Calculus, all of which we've actually added in there, things to basically find, like the symmetry plane points, add in boundary conditions so that your wing doesn't fly away when you apply a load and, and run it through the solver. Um, there's a bunch of other things that we've done in there in general to allow you to tie you know, multiple uh, FEM models together. So we've done this with a strut brace wing where we had the wing and the strut and a brace all modeled up in OpenVSP, all modeled within the finite element tools within OpenVSP and all have loads applied to them from VSP Euro and then the structures tied together. So we have a number of different tools that we'll include here in the future to allow you to do all of that. Um, and then within Viewer, once you've run Calculix, you can pull in that solution and take a look at, you know, the deflected geometry. So here we're just looking at the skin deflected on the left, uh, just with the baseline, actually VSP Euro geometry there in gray as a reference. You can look at the actual deflections. Um, you can look at the contours, in this case of the deflection magnitude. Um, on the right is basically the same information, but here it's showing it for the ribs and spars. So it's it's a fairly easy process now, at least for a single wing to go through and run VSP Euro. Uh, once you've got your finite element geometry modeled up and open the VSP, write that out, do the load mapping, um, and then run Calculix. Um, presently, this has all had to be done on, on the command line, but I expect uh, at some point this stuff will get rolled in so we'll be able to do this all from the GUI. So optimization. Uh, I've shown some optimizations in the past. I've used it basically to kind of like show that the code is kind of doing what you expect, where I've done kind of a reverse optimization, taking a Hershey bar wing and optimizing it to minimize drag and you'd expect basically to get back an elliptic loading. All that was done with finite difference methods. So you know typically in, in optimization you need to calculate gradients. You need to if you try to minimize drag you need the partial of drag with respect to you know whatever your design variables are. And so if you had you know 
30 design variables, maybe those were the, the twist along your wing from root to cord. You'd have to run VS Bureau once to get the drag at your design condition, and then you would have to vary each one of those design variables individually, rerun VS Bureau 30 more times, and then use finite differences to calculate those gradients. And so just in that one case there, essentially to do one step uh, costs you, you know, over 30 times the solution time of a single VS Bureau run, just because you had 30 design variables and you had to run 31 solves to get all of the gradients that you're required. Um, in addition to that, there's always round off issues. Uh, finite differences aren't exact, so you always have to decide you know, how much do you perturb each design variable to get a reasonable solution uh, for those gradients um, out of, you know, using a finite difference process. And another way to do this is using what's called the adjoint formulation, and I'll go through that in a little bit in a minute. But the benefit of that is that essentially the cost of calculating those gradient calculations becomes independent of the number of design variables. Um, here we're applying the adjoint formulation to the actual mesh nodes. So the XYZ locations on your mesh are the actual design variables. So if you run VSPRO, say in the vortex lattice mode, you might have, you know, a mesh with, you know, say 2,000 loops in it. So you would have on the order of say 2,000 nodes in your mesh, um, assuming they all got agglomerated into uh, quads. And so each node has an XYZ location, so you'd have on the order of, say, 6,000 design variables for a very simple way. So the process flow is basically you run via Spiro to obtain a flow solution at some cost to you. You know, de depends on your geometry and, you know, how many points you have to define that geometry. Uh, you would then run the adjoint solver to obtain the gradients of whatever objective function you're looking at. It might be CD, it might be CL, maybe you're trying to trim, maybe it's a combination of all of those. But you want the gradients of your objective function in respect to all the nodes in X, Y, and Z. Um, in general, that's costing right now on the order of about 5T. So if it took, you know, five seconds to run via Spiro, it's going to take on the order of like 25 seconds, a half a minute to run the adjoint solver. You can then use chain rule to get the gradients with respect to any open via speed parameter. I'll talk to that in a bit. Uh, then you can feed your favorite optimizer, and then you repeat the process. And so, you know, you converge to some optimum solution. Um, so can't go through a presentation without having some equations. Uh, so I just wanted to talk, you know, kind of at a high level, what I mean about adjoints. So in general, you've got some residual function. And so we can just basically, we have some function R of gamma and X. Gamma is the solution vector. So for a vortex lattice method or the panel method, we basically have vorticity strengths, where we should be a gamma sub I. Um, on you know, each panel. So that's a vector of uh, vorticity that's distributed across the entire surface. And you've got some mesh defined by all these nodes X sub I. And you've got basically uh, an equation at each vortex panel, which is basically that the flow has to be tangent to that panel. So that, that gives you a linear system of equations, AX equals B. Um, we can rewrite that as just AX minus B equals zero, or just at a higher level, R of gamma and X equals zero. So this is just a linear set of equations that fall out of either setting up a panel or vortex lattice solution. And then, you know, for a fixed geometry, we have, you know, J equals one of the M unknown values for the circulation, gamma J for each vortex panel. Um, and then, we, like I mentioned, we, you have the X sub I, which are basically your mesh nodes. Um, and so there will be a different number of nodes, not just M, in general, N nodes define your geometry. Or we can take the derivative of that residual function in respect to the mesh nodes X sub I and just use chain rule, basically. You get the partial of R respect to X plus the partial of R respect to gamma times D gamma DX. 
that's still equals zero. The original residual is zero, so the derivative equals zero. We can rearrange that, solve for dr dx. Um, and I'll just note that that dr d gamma term there is the Jacobian matrix for this residual function r. Right, so this doesn't seem like it help us any. Um, you know, we know that we basically want to calculate, you know, basically the, the change in, you know, the drag, for instance, with respect to the mesh, but we're kind of looking at what is the change in the residual with respect to X here. And we're showing it's just basically the partial of R respect to the gamma times the gamma DX. So this is just the, how much does your residual change if you change the solution vector gamma times how much does the solution vector gamma change if you change your mesh X sub I? Um, we can also rearrange that basically to solve for d gamma dx, um, and that's just equal to the inverse of that Jacobian matrix times dr dx. So again, that doesn't seem like it helped us much, but let's go and look at, you know, let's say we actually have some optimization problem we want to look at, and we want to minimize the vehicle drag coefficient cd. And in general, it's going to be a function of the solution gamma and the mesh x sub i. And on top of this, let's say we have some set of open VSP parameters, P sub I, you know, from one to N. So those might be the twists along the wing, or it could be the dihedral along the way, uh, the sweep along the wing. It could be anything that defines your geometry. Um, I've been talking wings here, but it, it could be the, you know, cross-sectional radii of your fuselage. Um, but these are, you know, in general, these parameters that are driving your geometry in OpenVSP, and you've got some number of them. So we can take the derivative of CD with respect to the mesh, so dc dx, that's just, again, chain rule, kind of like we did for the residual. So you get partial CD with respect to x, so that's the change in the drag with respect to the mesh change. And then you got partial CD with respect to gamma times d gamma dx. And so that's just the change in the drag coefficient when you change the solution times the change in solution when you, you know, respect to a change in the mesh. Um, we can basically rearrange that um, where we can get rid of that d gamma dx because we saw for that previously when we looked at the derivative of dr dx. So we can replace that d gamma dx term on the right hand side with the dr d gamma inverse times dr dx. And then we can rearrange things a little bit there, just combine the first two terms into a term and we have that dr dx there. So now we have something that looks even more complicated than we started with at the top of this page. And I'm going to define that stuff basically in the brackets there as, as psi transpose. So psi is a vector, um, and so that whole thing inside the brackets, if you look at it, it's basically a vector times the inverse of the matrix. And so it's a, it's a vector, and we're going to call that psi transpose. So we've defined psi transpose, this, you know, like I have there at the bottom of the page. And so if somehow we knew psi transpose, we could calculate psi transpose times dr dx. You know, negate that and add it into partial CD respect to X, and that gives you the total derivative that we started with at the top, top of the page. So that's the change in the drag respect to the mesh. So the question is, can we calculate psi? So we can rearrange this, and uh, basically if you take the inverse of both sides, the transpose of both sides, do a little bit of algebra, you can come up with this equation for psi. So it's this dr d gamma, again, that's the Jacobian matrix, transpose times psi equals the partial of CD respect to gamma transpose. So the right-hand side is the, the change in your drag respect to the solution change. And the left-hand side matrix is just your Jacobian matrix transpose. So this whole thing is called the adjoint equation. And if you solve this, if you can, if you can formulate this and actually solve this for psi, it allows us to calculate the gradients of CD respect to the mesh nodes x sub i. Um, and so, for the solving, you know, a single system of equations basically gives you, you know, the solution for dc dx for gradients for every node. 
So the question is, can you solve this efficiently? And the answer, of course, is yes. Um, and then you go back down. If we really care about the CD respect to some open VSP parameter, we basically just use chain rules. So we have partial CD respect to some parameter that you've got defined uh, for your model in open VSP. That's just the partial CD respect to X sub I, which is what we've been working towards solving here. So we, we know that, presuming we've solved this adjoint problem. And we just multiply that times the partial of X I respect to P. So that's that second term there, the DX DI. D, DX sub I respect to P. It's just a change in your geometry with respect to some parameter in the mesh. And you basically are doing this every day when you're playing around with OpenVSP and you're moving that slider around to change the span of your wing. That's basically, you know, calculating on the fly the partial of span or of the wing geometry with respect to that span variable. So we can basically easily calculate the change in mesh with respect to your various parameters. We can store that. Um, and then we basically do this inner product, this chain rule, to get DCDP. So the adjoint equation, it's linear. Um, we can use automatic differentiation tools to help us set up that system of equations. I'm not going to go into that here today, um, but I'm basically making use of the depth C++ plus plus framework to do that. Uh, it turns out we can reuse pretty much all of the VSP solver framework to solve that linear equation. We then get the gradients with respect to any number of design variables for the cost of one VSPIRO and one adjoint solved. Um, and like I said, basically right now that adjoint solve is on the order of about five times the cost of a single VSPIRO solve. So if you're just running, you know, a single design variable, and that's not really an optimization, it's more of a trade study, but if you're just running a single design variable, you know, wing twist at the root, then it would be faster just to do finite differences, all things being equal. If you're doing more than about five design variables, which is going to be the norm on most any real design problem, um, then this would be a break even situation. And if you're doing more than that, then the adjoint uh, process that we've put together here uh, would be a time saving. Um, so, and, and then there's a lot of uh, work that is going to go into to hopefully reducing that cost for the adjoint, probably down to something on the order of two times the cost is where I think it will end up being. Um, there's a, a lot of, uh, you know, alpha, beta-ish code in there now that all works but isn't the cleanest. So the test case, uh, just a simple wing, uh, incompressible Mach 0 0.01, five degrees angle of attack, stuck the CG up there near the nose uh, of the vehicle. So by definition, it doesn't trim. Um, I'm running this in VLM mode. It will work for both VLM and for panel mode. Um, really, there, there's no difference in the setup or run, but just in the run time, since it's easier and faster to do VLM. Um, obviously using the adjoint solver for the gradients. Uh, so the design variables, I have nine sweep values along the span, nine twist values along the span, nine dihedral values along the span. So there are 27 design variables. So if you're doing this with finite differences, you would have to run the solver once at this Mach 01 and five degrees angle of attack. And then you would perturb all of those design variables one at a time and run 27 additional solutions. Uh, for a total of 28 VSPO runs, um, you know, kind of per uh, optimization step where you would need those gradients. Um, I threw together uh, just a, a simple Python based conjugate gradient optimizer. Um, and I'm just using a penalty formulation to uh, basically minimize this functional here that I, I list out. So it's basically, you know, CL minus some CL required, which is was set to 0.5 squared uh, plus, you know, CM squared plus CD squared. And then A, B, and C are just these penalty function weights. Um, so if, you know, let's say B and C were both zero, then your functional would just basically drive CL to CL required. And that would be the minimum of F. 
if you add in you know a non-zero b, then now that cm squared term uh, becomes into play, and the minimum is going to have to be obviously cm would go to zero. Um, if c is non-zero, then again you're going to try to minimize this functional. So now the value of cd comes to play, and obviously you're never going to get cd to go to zero unless you like drove cl to zero. Um, and you know it was basically no twist, uh, no dihedral, just a flat plate. So that CO is also zero. Um, you're always going to have induced drag if you generate any CL. And since we're driving CL to 0.5, CD is never going to zero. So you're just you're gonna, it's going to try to minimize that CD, try to drive CD down to zero, such that CM goes to zero and CL goes to the 0.5 value. So the Graphic there is just the initial solution on this swept kind of default wind coming out of uh, OpenVSP. We run this, uh, ran it out basically. It, it's doing uh, nine iterations of the conjugate gradient uh, solution. So it's, it's evaluating the gradients nine times. Um, you can kind of see those in the steps there where there's big steps and kind of like where the gradients are going on. It's a little less obvious in the later stages where things aren't changing as much. But the upper left corner is just the value of sweep, uh, then upper right dihedral, which isn't changing a whole lot, and then twist. And so what you end up with is, you know, basically this goal-shaped wing. Um, you know, it's trying to uh, trim this vehicle. And you know, in the initial uh, guess at your geometry, the CG was at the apex of the wing, and so all of the lift was behind the CG. So the only way it can actually really kind of twist is a sharp moving link, lift forward and then adjust the twist along the span. So it does that. Um, and it also does you know, play around with both the twist and the dihedral because it's trying to minimize that induced drag. Just looking at the loading, which is the upper left corner, the baseline loading there is in purple, and then the optimized loading is shown in green. So it's, it's kind of loading up the roots, unloading the tips. Uh, just the CL history there along the functional evaluations. So it quickly, you know, it's starting down there, to, uh, CL of around 0.44-ish, it's trying to drive that up to 0.5. The CD one, it's not really trying to drive to anything, it's trying to keep it minimum, but it, you know, it has, it's increasing the drag, the, the CD is going to go up in general, um, but it's trying to keep that at, at a minimum as much as it can. And then CM hasn't quite driven it to zero here, it's a trade-off between all the other uh, weights there in the, in the penalty function. I basically put a much larger weight on CL versus CM. If you played around with those weights, you could trade off uh, you know, on CM or CL. I'll let this play a little bit here. So this is just kind of an animation of the optimization process. Um, so within Viewer, you can load in all of the intermediate solutions during the optimization process, at least as I've coded them up for my simple Python script, which we can include in the distribution in the future. Um, just kind of showing what it's doing. So initially, it really goes after you know, that sweep. Then if you look at you know, the tips, it's playing around with both the dihedral and with the twist. And so, you know, this is not meant to be uh, like the end all in terms of optimiz optimizers. I, I, like I did, I just wrote a very simple conjugate gradient uh, optimizer in Python. There's obviously a lot of other uh, much, say, better optimizers out there. This whole development, uh, this code is actually being uh, pulled into NASA's open MDAO uh, framework, which I don't know if we're going to, anybody's going to talk about that this week, but open MDAO is also open source. Um, it allows you to tie together, you know, any number of models 
um, in a framework that allows you to do optimization. And so in that framework, one of the optimizers that they have is SNOPT. So this has been pulled into, into that framework and, you know, where they have, a, a, you know, I'll call a real optimizer where you can actually do optimization with constraints um, and not just some simple, simple penalty formulation like I've done here. Um, but the focus here on this discussion really should be on, you know, the gradient calculations and how that's benefiting from the adjoint formulation. So just some notes on this. You know, this ran in like three minutes on my laptop. Uh, it was like 45 seconds for all of the adjoint uh, gradient solves. There were nine gradient solves in, in, for this solution here. It's about 20 seconds for all the solver solves. There was like about 65. Uh, you know, individual uh, solver solves in this process. So that's, you know, 65 seconds. So like a third of the time was actually VSPRO. The other two thirds of the time were spent in my probably not very well written Python code. Um, I just used default Python lists and everything. So I'm sure we could, I could get all that basically down to, uh, you know, a fraction of that remaining two minutes um, the way I coded it. But that really wasn't the point here. But just looking at the, the adjoint solves themselves for calculating the gradients, for this case where you've got 27 design variables, it's essentially uh, almost two times faster than using finite differences would be for this case. Um, if you just look at what the cost of an individual VSPRO solve is and then multiplying that by 27. Um, so already in this case where you've got, you know, on the order of 30 design variables, it's faster. Um, and my expectation is that this will get faster um, in the future once we go in and optimize the code. Okay. So my final topic, and I think I'm doing okay here in time, uh, things that go round and round. So right now there's kind of two ways, well I should, well, in the past there were two ways to model rotors in VSPRO. The actuator disk model, and you know it was fast. Uh, it's really developed for propellers, not for rotors, and it really doesn't work for edgewise flow. Yeah, I mean you can run it for edgewise flow, um, and if you're you know not totally on an edgewise, then maybe you'll get a reasonable answer out of it. But you know it really, it, the theory really was not developed for edgewise rotor type flows. It's it's based on you know basically flow coming in normal to the actuator disk and so anything even at a slight angle of attack really is kind of you know breaking the assumptions in the underlying theory that went into that model the other way that you could model uh, rotors was the unsteady analysis um, it's not so fast um, at least compared to you know just a single steady state solution but it works for propellers, it works for rotors, it works for, you know, those in combination with wings and bodies. Um, so it's, it's fairly general um, and within the, you know, framework and theory of the vortex lattice of the panel methods, it, it seems to do a decent job. Um, but it is expensive compared to, you know, running a single VSPR solution, say, with an actual risk. So like bicycles, more is always better. So of implementing a third way. Um, basically, I'm calling it the quasi-unsteady model for rotors. So the rotors are modeled, um, not actuator disk. So you go in there and actually use the, the prop geometry that's in OpenVSP. Um, those will be taken in, and VSPRO generates a guess at the helical wake shape. That's based on basically your free stream velocity, the RPM of the rotor, um, and, you know, the local angle attack of the vehicle. The rotors and their wakes think they are rotating. Um, the rest of the vehicle doesn't. Um, so there's uh, some magic going in there. And, uh, but let's just say that, you know, when the rotors, when the influences of the rotors and when the updates of the wakes occurred, they think they are rotating while the rest of the geometry clearly isn't. Um, wake shape is iterated on to account for, you know, all the wing-body interactions, just like you would have normal if you had wings and bodies. 
um, and wakes coming off of them. Wake wake interactions, including you know, and self-induced flow. So the rotors, the wakes of the rotors interact with wakes of other rotors, interact with their own rotor wakes, and you know, and all those wakes from wings and other rotors interact with them. Um, however, the wakes are constrained to move in the thrust and feed stream direction. So the updates occur, and then there's a projection process that goes to basically constrain the motion of those wake updates to move in what I'm calling the thrust direction and the free stream direction. So the thrust direction is, that's basically defined by the normal of, um, you know, if you want to think of an actuator disc, but the normal to the, the thrust plane and the free stream direction, which is just defined by, you know, the angle metallic and uh, the side slip angle. It's slower than the actuator disc model, but it's a lot faster than time accurate model. And you can apply it for edgewise flows, i.e. rotors can be modeled. Um, only question is, is, you know, is it useful? So as a test case, um, and I'll just note this is all kind of early work in progress, but it is going to roll out. Um, and so, you know, we need to do more validation on this, but I've convinced myself it's a path worth going down at this point. Um, so this is just a Mach 0 0.01, 0 degrees angle attack, um, Hershey bar wing, span of 40, ratio 4. It's at 10 degrees angle of attack. I've just yanked in two default propellers out of open VSP. They're at plus or minus 10 in the span. Running at 860 RPM, you can blame Rob for that number and Uber. Um, the solutions were done. I just ran the wing alone, so you can see a comparison of what the loading and the forces look like on the wing alone. Wing plus the actuator disc model, the quasi steady, and then the time accurate. So the time accurate solution here is shown on the left, and then we're just looking at the CP distribution, or well, really the delta CP on the wing and the wakes. The wakes on the right for the quasi steady look a little bit different, obviously. It's, you know, but in general, there's, uh, you know, there's an interaction between both the, the wakes of the wing and the wakes of the rotor. Um, but you don't see exactly the same kind of, uh, you know, interference that you would see on the unsteady. Um, there are fewer wake lines coming off the quasi steady. Um, I've been playing around with, you know, just how how many points along the span of the rotor blade do you need for these quasi steady? And in general, I found it's it's less than you'd want to run for the time accurate solution, um, you know, in in terms of that pain benefit trade off. Um, so the wing CL distribution. So the wing alone is shown in blue. The wing plus the actuator disc is kind of that uh, burnt orange color there. Um, the unsteady average solution, so this is the unsteady solution uh, on the wing averaged over the last rotor uh, rotation um, is shown in, um, in green. And I'll just note to begin with that it's quite a bit different than the actual rotor dis, the actuator disc solution. And then the, the quasi steady solution there is in purple. Um, and so, you know, none of these solutions actually lie on top of each other. But in general, the uh, quasi steady is doing a reasonable job of capturing kind of the general shape of the unsteady average solution which again is an unsteady average. So if you were to plot this as a function of time, you'd see this loading, you know, changing quite, quite a bit, you know, as, as the rotor rotated and the various trolling wakes interacted with the wing. Um, looking at this, you would basically say that the actuator just is, is doing a horrible job. Um, but then if you actually look at, you know, the forces and moments here, so the unsteady uh, forces and moments are on the top one. The, the next line is the quasi unsteady, um, and then the actuator disc and the wing alone. And it's worth looking at, you know, that top line and the bottom line. You look at the wing alone, the you know axial force and say you know the the y force, but really that axial force um, 
you know, and again, this is not drag, this is CX, um, you know, is negative. So the sign changes just when you add in, you know, that rotor, whether your model is an actuator disc or full and steady or quasi unsteady. The unsteady and quasi steady, unsteady, you know, in terms of CX, CY, and CZ all do a very reasonable, you know, I'd say the quasi steady is doing a very reasonable job of getting the forces. And in terms of pitching moments, the, the same thing is true. Um, it's, it's notable that, uh, you know, the, in pitching, the, you know, you look at CMY, that basically there's this reduction in pitching moment that's shown for the unsteady and quasi-unsteady, at least in an average sense for the unsteady. You see that with the quasi-steady. The actuator does actually, it shows it going in the other direction. Um, compared to the wing alone. And then CMZ, um, right, which is this yawing moment, um, is, uh, you know, zero for the wing alone. Um, all the methods actually do a reasonable job of, of predicting this if you're just comparing this to wing alone. Um, you know, the, the quasi-steady, unsteady is, is ever so slightly maybe better, but um, you know, I would say, is this, you know, exactly reproducing the unsteady solution? No. Um, is it useful? Um, I think yes. So the solution times, and this is kind of where, you know, I, why I say it's useful. Solution time, six rotations. It's about, you know, 1,500 seconds on my laptop just chugging away. Um, the quasi-unsteady runs in like 11 sections, seconds. The actuator disk six seconds, the queen wing, you know, one second. So there is more cost there to, you know, this quasi uh, steady method compared to just running a queen wing or the actuator disc, but it's literally like two orders of magnitude faster than the unsteady. Uh, rotating those rotors, you know, 90 degrees. Uh, so you basically have edgewise flow. This is, everything is, is, is the same except for the location and orientation of those rotors. Time accurate solution there on the left, the quasi steady state solution on the right. Um, this one actually does have uh, a similar number of resolution in the same large direction on uh, the rotors for both models. There's obviously a lot more interaction going on on the you know for the time accurate solution between the wakes. Um, but you still, if you look at it, you know you can kind of convince yourself you're capturing some of that in the quasi steady solution. And if we look at the wing CL distribution, so the wing alone again is in blue. The actuator disc is in that burnt orange, and it's just wrong. I mean, the method just really isn't meant to do edgewise flow, and the solution you're getting out of it is just wrong. There are some games you could play to maybe get something better, but really the model is just not meant for edgewise flow. The unsteady average solution there in green um, and the quasi steady in purple. Um, do they lie on top of each other? No. Um, but I think you know you're getting uh, you know some of the, you're, you're seeing the delta of the impacts of this rotor on the way. Um, and so the question is, you know, for the amount of time you put in, is this information useful to your design process? I think it can be. If you look at the wing forces and moments, we don't do quite as good as we did for the propeller case, um, but we're clearly doing a heck of a lot better than we did with the actuator. Um, so the you know CX uh, and CYs and CW, CZs, um, you know, you know they're within you know 30 to 50 percent of the actual values. But I think you need to look at those as deltas from the wing alone. To understand that if you know you're looking for trends, um, which I think it, you know this level of analysis and then this level of uh, you know conceptual design is probably what you're looking for. I think it actually provides you some very useful information, um, and specifically something like CMY, the trim. Um, it's you know acting in the right direction. So it's definitely showing the impact of those rotors on the wing in terms of trim, as well as in terms of the forces. 
So solution times, uh, about 20 seconds on my laptop, you know, six rotations of the blades, about 73 seconds for the quasi unsteady. Um, I should say that you know these take uh, more than you know the typical three-ish wake iterations. I'm running these out uh, typically you know, on the order of 10 to 15 wake iterations to get the solution to settle down. Um, that's going to be very much geometry dependent, um, but it's kind of like running you know high lift cases in DSP where you've got you know flaps and whatnot modeled. Um, there's a lot of wake interactions going on, and you need to run out enough wait iterations to get that to settle down. Actuator disk, I mean, it took five seconds, but the answer was just point out wrong. And obviously the queen wing, you know, it's on the order of a second again. Um, but obviously that doesn't give you any information about what's going on in this configuration. Last one, uh, this, is, this is kind of more of a good two graphic. This is the Uber geometry. Time accurate solutions on the left, quality steady on the right. Again, you getting all the interactions between the, the blades. Uh, um, so you know, if you stare at it uh, and squint, you can see that you know you're you're capturing some of these interactions that are going between the blades as well as the wing, uh, you know, wakes. From a load standpoint, uh, you know, this is like by far you know the worst solution uh, you've seen today in terms of comparisons. You've got the unsteady average up near you know, the top, the wing alone near the bottom, quasi steady is kind of splitting difference. Um, but if you look at the integrated force and moments, we don't do bad. Um, you know, you look at CX and CY, CZ, um, all the trends are actually there and they're actually fairly close. You know, CZ is off by 50% maybe. Um, CMY, which is, you know, probably the big one in terms of trimming the vehicle and trying to understand the impact of rotor RPMs and, you know, how, how are you going to trim this vehicle, um, actually is scarily good, um, probably better than it deserves to be. Um, and again, you know, you want to compare these all to the wing alone solutions, um, you know, so CM is, you know, it's pitching down and it's pitching up, right? Um, so. Um, obviously, th these are just the, the, the forces and moments on the wing. Um, you know, these would be you know traded off with the you know the thrust and the forces that are occurring. You know, with the, the delta pitching moment caused by the thrust. So you you trim this vehicle out with the rotors. So that Uber case, twelve rotations. I really ran that one out. Uh, it was like five and a half hours on my laptop, and the quasi steady was seven minutes. Right. So I think for what you're getting from the quasi steady solution, um, the trade off in time is quite worth it. So what's next? Uh, I'm going to quickly go over this. I only have a couple minutes. Uh, improvements to the joint. Most of it is basically trying to speed things up. It's a single processor right now. So I'm going to try to figure out how to do multiprocessor. Um, there's a bunch of wasted CPU cycles where things are basically being recalculated, reprocessed multiple times, um, and trying to improve memory usage uh, overall in the adjunct calculation. Structural analysis, um, including both you know wings in, and bodies in the future. Um, I should add in here Nashran. We definitely want to put that in. Um, we're looking at trying to do some coupled solution process. Probably going to go down the mode shape path. Um, ultimately, I'd like to be able to do some flutter analysis. Um, and then the quasi unsteady, like I said, this is kind of like a uh, work in progress. This is something that's just been going on the last couple months. Um, there's additional things that we could do to relax the rotor weight, uh, you know, iteration, shape, relaxation. Um, I'd like to tie this in with the noise prediction so that we can do kind of a quasi steady state noise prediction. Um, and then obviously one of the, the big ones that we want to do this is basically trim the vehicle using RPM and or generating rotor control type derivatives. All right. I think I got it. Well, Dave, thanks a lot. That is um, an incredibly impressive amount of stuff. You've clearly been very, very busy. And, you know, most of this stuff uh, has not been released yet and um, hasn't even made it to me yet. So 
hopefully these things will be becoming mainstream over the next uh, few months. That'll be really exciting to see. While, while Brandon cues himself up, I think you can safely stop sharing your screen. While Brandon cues up for the next one, we've had a bunch of questions. Uh, Brandon answered some of them, but I'd, I'd like to just take a minute to have you answer some of the questions from the, from the forum. Um, let's just, and some of these Brandon answered, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask you again. So one of first, what does the CL max variable do in the input file? Is it still supported given the new stall prediction tool? Do you, what do you, what should you set that to if you're using the new stall predictor? Yeah, if I turn my camera on, you can see my dog. Um, so it's uh, if you're running it, you know, editing the .vsvr file by hand. If you you set it co max to minus nine nine nine, it will kick in the the new co max. Okay, so co max minus nine nine nine. Okay, and otherwise it operates the way it always did. Yep. Great. Um, Let's see, would you give an answer just a little bit about the logic of when is a DGEN geom file used, when is a VSP geom file used, and when is a try file used, and how does it pick? Yeah, so it depends on what's in the, what's in the directory, and I'm going off by the top of my head, so it's probably wrong. <laughs> but um, if you have a, it, it, what it should be doing is if you've got a VSP, a VSP job, it should take that first. Um, whether or not, you know, that's a, well, and I know Rob's going to talk about for, for the VSP job, that could actually be either a Vortex Lattice model or it could be a panel model, but it should grab that first. Um, if it doesn't find that, then it should look for a try file and load that in. If it doesn't find that, then it should look for basically the you know the CSV file for the GGM job. Um, and so that is essentially the order. Um, for the panel solves, it will also look and see if there is a CSV file sitting around. But I think there it assumes that there is an underscore GGM geom tied, tied to it. And it would try to pull from that CSV file things like the rotor, you know, rotor prop locations, things like that, stuff that's not in the try file um, and not in the VSP John file, but were in the uh, CSV file. So yeah, I'll thank you, Dave. I'll I'll add to that answer and just say that the um, the the GUI tries to make that invisible to the user so that when you choose general i'd say for panel runs there's no reason not to use the vsp geom file it ought to work pretty well uh the thing to check when you look at it in viewer is if it captured the entire wake correctly there might still be some problems where you know at the very root of your wing or at the very tip of your wing part there's there's a part where there was a wake that did not get attached and if so uh, share that test case on the VSP group, uh, on the Google group with me, and I'll try and get it fixed. Um, the experimental file format does theoretically work with VLM files, but it's much more experimental right now um, in that we're still working through uh, how that intersection works and whether those files are intersected or not intersected. So there's a difference in how those are handled. Um, what this this whole thing, and we will talk about this a little bit later in some of the other talks, the direction that Dave and I are, are, are driving towards is, you know, a unified run mode where you, where we always use the VSP geom file and where you choose individually on a, on a, essentially a component by component basis, whether that component has a thick surface like a panel representation or a thin surface like a VLM representation. The idea being that wings, vertical tails, horizontal tails, and rotors, any sort of lifting surface, you would most likely model with a thin surface potato chip VLM style representation. And all you know, bodies, pods, you know, big fat things that don't lift, 
you would model with a thick surface representation. And then we actually have the ability now to trim those thin, mixed geometries of thin and thick surfaces. So we would have all the benefits that Dave was talking about where VLM does just an amazingly good job with lifting surfaces, but we would also get some of the blockage modeling from the thick surfaces. So that's, that's where we're headed, um, but that's still probably a, a few versions from completion. Um, there's a question, can the convergence tolerance be specified in VSP arrow? No, well, it's open source, so technically yes. But no, I mean, there's there's basically, you know, it's converging, it's trying to drop the residuals by one order of magnitude. Um, if you're doing the default, which is like three wake iterations, it will drop, you know, during each iteration, it drops that residual uh, one order of magnitude. So in actuality, you're, you're dropping the total residual by three orders of magnitude. Um, if you want, you know, if you look at that way from, you know, solving the equation, you know, if you were to fix the wakes, and that's why if you actually set number of wake iterations to zero, it will drive it, I think in the current version, three orders of magnitude, I think I've relaxed that to two orders of magnitude. Um, but, uh, and then the second one is that there's a constraint on the maximum, you know, the, the maximum residual, um, that usually doesn't kick in. Um, for well-behaved geometries, at least for the vortex virus. I've done some tweaking in the version that Rob will be getting for panel solves that uh, tries to do a more intelligent choice of that value um, to still get good solutions that, you know, with a reduced number of iterations. But um, yeah, there, there's, it's, not, it's not a user input on the, in, on the file. I, I would say for the VSP on John, VSP John stuff, all the adjoint gradient work was done using VSP John for Dex Lattice mode. Um, and like Rob said, that's where we're going. And that's like, if you want to do optimization right now, you would have to write out everything with VSP John. Cool. Um, has anybody applied the new stall method to a powered lift case like the X57? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, someone noticed we've got the stability method that'll run, you know, at least seven cases and perturb all the different parameters and do stability control derivatives. But often they just want to find the aerodynamic center and the static margin, uh, which they can do manually. But is there any plan to have an automatic aerodynamic center estimate that doesn't do anything else? And are the adjoints going to play into the derivative estimation? I mean, it would be easy enough to add that in. So if somebody reminds me, I'll, I'll add it in as a stab option, um, if, if that's what people want. Um, I would not see using that the adjoint to do that or any of the stability derivatives and stuff. I mean, we could, um, but it's pretty fast the way it is already. So I, I, I I think it would end up being a wash for most cases. But I mean, it's I've thought about it. Um, okay. But you start adding up all the derivatives and everything. It, I think even with the number of derivatives we have to do stab and control, maybe if you did control surfaces, maybe it'd be worth it. So maybe it's worth looking there at the adjoint formulation. I'll just have one last question. Um, if you would talk a little bit about supersonics with VSP Aero, someone was asking about it on YouTube, and if anybody had done a Concord, how's the supersonics looking in VSP Aero? Um, there's, a, there's a whole presentation on the WaveFrag tool, but um, is just your comments on the on supersonic capability, and, that's, and then Brandon can go. Yeah, I mean, I look, like I said, look at the, the previous your workshop presentation, I, I talk about the supersonic stuff there in more detail, but it really only works for the vortex lattice. Um, so you're not going to get thickness effects or anything like that in terms of like, you know, trying to get the pressure distribution. So I know I've had a lot of people ping me on trying to do things like predicting sonic boom and stuff like that. Um, I mean, you can get the load distribution, the lift distribution from the vortex lattice. Um, but nothing has changed over the last year in terms of that. 
I mean, I've, I've had some discussions with various people on, you know, extending the panel solver to supersonic, but that just hasn't happened, and I don't have any time frame where that might happen. Thanks so much, Dave. Really appreciate the talk. Yep. Thanks, Dave. That was uh, quite a lot of material to cover in, in just the hour that we gave you. So